Genesis chapter 6, and we left off at verse 5. So, the last time, fresh review, is we left off concerning Noah. So you might recall that Noah, that he was getting born, but we didn't really discuss too much about him. We, just, we discussed about his uh, ancestry. And then we discussed about the world that Noah was in. So that's what we were more concentrated on, not really Noah himself. Now the world that time, remember, they were following Cain's system. So within Cain's system, the sons of God, they in intermingled with the daughters of men, which has caused a quite a huge problem. They mingled themselves with mankind. With this intermingling, it resulted with uh, giants. And I've given you some scriptural proof text on the giants that they are a real group of people, that it actually did happen, and we've seen some scriptural proof text concerning them. Now that we left off the giants, what also happened? There's a lot of wicked things that happened from this intermingling, from this result and the consequence of mankind's sin. So we're going to cover some areas on what else they did, and what you're going to see is like what I taught you so many times. What men learn from history is that men never learn from history. They'll never get that. So we're going to cover some areas here on what else mankind did that they just did not learn their lesson from. Okay. We left off at Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Meaning what it says that the Lord God Almighty, he was looking and seeing that mankind in their sin and their iniquity, they were very, very wicked. And mankind's wickedness was great. It was so huge. Now, reminding you again, as we go through verse by verse Bible study, look at the verse that I'm reading word for word and look how I explain every word. That way you can understand the wording of your King James Bible. At the beginning, usually people say that the King James Bible is hard to understand, but actually, it's just that you don't have a common sense gist of it yet. So once you go through this verse-by-verse -verse Bible study, you're going to get the common sense gist on how the words play out and how the grammar and the structure and everything works out. And while I'm explaining the words out of every verse, pretty soon you'll be doing it in your mind as I do it. So that's why I want to encourage you to please look at the verse I'm reading and see how I explain every word. And that way you can do it yourself. And then when you do your Bible reading, you'll realize how simple it is. Amen. Okay? So I always usually say that as a fresh reminder. All right, again, mankind's wickedness is very great. It's huge. It's all over the earth. Notice what follows that. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Meaning that every single thought that they have in their heart that produces imaginations, right? Imaginations are things that you picture, that you fantasize. What you see uh, in your own mind. It only concentrates on evil and it does it continuously. That's very important to understand because if this is the state a mankind's heart was only evil continuously. This is the birth to everything that we result in our world today, the consequence of man's sin. And we don't realize how wicked we are. We have to be on guard and notice that it's following the same pattern of today during Cain's timeline, Noah's timeline. Nothing ever changed from Genesis to Revelation. Mankind's nature is always the same. And you can fall into that pattern. I've shown you so many times that you can follow the pattern of Genesis, so you have to be very wary and watchful of yourself so as not to imitate Genesis 5 and 6 again. Now, you are very capable of falling into Genesis 6-5, Every sin, remember, every sin and wickedness of man was great on the earth can only come to pass when it comes from the heart. That's from this verse here, from verse 5. Because they have this in their heart, that's why it produces the great wickedness. 
So unless you guard your heart to begin with, then you won't produce this wickedness. So watch yourself. You don't want to end up like this. Uh, you think that, no, I'm not going to end up like that. Yeah, you will if you're not careful. So I'm going to show you uh, several passages that you should be wary of. Look at Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17. Some of you might not think that you're as wicked as you thought you might be. But you've got to realize that a lot of what you say, your manners, your attitude, your personality, it all comes from what you think. It comes from who you are. So a lot of things might slip up by accident as sin and you might not even catch it. You might say, why is that? Because the heart is very deceitful and you can't even know it yourself. A lot of times, especially when you get married, you, or if you have someone who's very close to you, you won't recognize on some of the things that you said or some of the things that you slipped up and messed up until your significant other or the person who's close to you told you, hey, did you know that you've been doing blah, 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 and you've done this and this and this, and this hurt somebody, 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 and that was pretty rude, inconsiderate, and then you go, oh, I didn't know that before, and I didn't recognize that before. Well, why not? It's because the heart is desperately wicked who can know it. No one can. Look at Jeremiah 17. So you have to be on guard of your heart. Look at verse 9. The heart is deceitful. See, it's not something you know. It tricks you into sinning. You might think you're right with God, but do you really know you're right with God? It can trick you, deceive you. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Remember, Genesis 6 said the wickedness of man was great on the earth. Why? Because the thoughts of his heart was only evil continuously. Why is that? Why are they so evil? It's not just because that, hey, they're deliberately wicked and evil. It's because the heart is very deceitful. Who can know it? A lot of things you do wrong unconsciously, not consciously. That's why you have to be on guard. You might say, well, pastor, I want to improve. Uh, how do I do that? I mean, a lot of times I do things unconsciously. 2 Corinthians 10. This is what you need to know. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. This is going to be very helpful for you. It's a verse that you memorize too. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4 through 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and uh, verse 4 through 5. What you need is to catch yourself. That's the bottom line. But see, a lot of times when you talk, think, and say something, you don't catch yourself. Why? You just... Do it because you just do it how your flesh feels. You just go by what you say. That's your instinct. That's a fleshly, natural instinct. And you have to catch yourself. You have to go, wait a minute, before I say this, is that right? Before I think this, is this right? Before I feel this way, whether depressed or angry, frustrated, etc., is this right? Do you always tend to do that or you just go by it because that's how your flesh feels, that's how your flesh thinks, that's how your flesh says stuff? Come on, Pastor. When you do that, that's why the heart will deceive you without you knowing it. And then pretty soon you commit these sins that these same people do at Genesis 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Casting down imaginations. So there are imaginations that are wrong that you've got to cast down. And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. This is what you fail to do. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. See, when's the last time you took your thought and caught it? Took it captive. Did you catch what you thought? No, you don't. You just think it. You just say it, don't you? You just imagine whatever imagination comes to your mind. You don't spend time catching it, examining it with prayer, examining it with scripture and saying, is this right, Lord? Notice when you take it captive, it's done what at the last part of verse 5? To the obedience of Christ. You don't catch it and do it, examine it through prayer. You don't catch it, examine it through Bible, what you know. Don't catch it and examine it with the Lord. That's to the obedience of Christ that you fail to do. And you would do better if you're aware of verse 4. Verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. 
Uh, what your problem is, is that you don't realize you're, in, according to verse 4, you don't realize you're in spiritual warfare. And you don't realize that uh, your warfare is not physical, fleshly, but spiritual. If you recognize that the devil does attack your mind, right? If you realize that, then you're going to be more aware and, I, and you're going to go, I know that adversary is real, he's going to attack my mind. That's the very first step that you need to have and always tell yourself this, did the devil use me just now? If you were to always ask yourself that question, you'd be more wary and then you can do verse 5 by catching it more easily. You know why this world ended up as wicked as they are and the wicked man, wickedness of man was very great on the earth? It's pretty simple. They don't believe the devil exists. That's the problem. They don't believe in real spiritual warfare. That's our world today. Oh, Satan's not real. He's a myth. And that's why some atheists end up becoming Satanists, of all things. For what? Because they don't really believe that he exists. So they just do it for kicks. The wickedness level is totally extreme. Because they first don't realize the devil could use me just now. If they had that at the beginning, they would have done a much better job to guard their heart. All right, I hope that this has helped you immensely. Go to Genesis 6. Genesis 6. I've given you something extremely important today. I hope that you'll remember that. This is bigger than the deep doctrines you hear about the giants <laughs> and the mythology creatures. People spend too much time concentrating on those deep things rather than their own walk with Jesus Christ. What good is it you know all the conspiracies, all the myths, all the giants, all the demonic stuff when you yourself don't fix your walk with Jesus Christ? Then your spiritual walk is no different from those who don't even know about the wickedness, the giants, the demons, the conspiracies. You're just as backslidden as they are in their walk with Jesus Christ. Good preaching. All right? Watch your walk. All right, let's look at Genesis chapter 6 and uh, verse 6. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. Okay, what does that mean? It means, notice here, that and it, what's that referring to? It's referring to verse 5, everything that's going on with mankind's wickedness. So because of mankind's wickedness, this made what? At verse 6, repented the Lord that he had made man. So repent means a change of mind. A change of mind. So notice that God, he had a change of mind about the... About what? Notice the verse says about his creation. God repented of the creation that he did with Adam and Eve and the rest of the human race. Now, is that possible? Yeah, God can change his mind. Why? He's a person. He can do whatever he wants. It's that simple. Do I have the right to change my mind if I want to? Sure. So why wouldn't God? So I don't know why people have to restrict God to something where, no, he can't change his mind even if he wants to. No, let him do. He has his right. He can do whatever he wants to do. But that is the thing where people try to confuse about the immutability of God. Immutability means unchanging. Our God is not changing. He is still. He is always the same. But they confuse that with verse 6 where God changed his mind. That he had made man on the earth, right? That's his creation of mankind. He had a change of mind about that. Why? Because he has the right at the last part of verse 6, and it grieved him at his heart. His heart was grieved with mankind's wickedness and state. So because of that, obviously he wanted to have a change of mind. Look at uh, Numbers 23. Numbers 23. But this becomes a problem here. The problem is, isn't our God unchanging? And that's one of the contradictions, supposedly, with Christian doctrine or in your Bible that critics will point out, saying, oh, look at this, your God changes his mind, but in his Bible, it says that he doesn't repent, he doesn't change his mind. Well, those same, those same blinded, ignorant people fail to read the context. You've got to look at the context. 
Look at Numbers chapter 23. Now notice what Balaam said to Balak when he was up, uh, he was up on the mount at verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie. So unlike mankind, God doesn't lie like them. When he says something, he's going to make it good. See, he doesn't change what he says, right? Neither the son of man that sh he should repent. Whoa, so meaning God don't change his mind. He don't repent. That seems to contradict Genesis 6. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? There's your answer that they didn't read. God does not repent. Look at this dividing line here. He does not repent when he puts a statement to it. That's the thing. There is no repentance when he puts his word in there. It's like, I mean, say that to your lover. Say that to your lover that, uh, honey, uh, I promise that I will uh, not mess up on our date night and we will ha spend a romantic di dinner together. And then what happens when you break it? Then they're not happy, right? So that's why God's saying, I'm not like mankind in that sense. When I put my statement, my word to it, I will make it good. I won't let you down. That's why when God gives you a promise in his word, take heart, he's not going to repent. He's not going to change his mind about it. But when did he ever said when he created man, when he said, when I create man, I'm not going to destroy them. I'm not going to regret them. He never said that. The Bible just said he created man. All right? He never put a statement or his word to it. It's that simple. A lot of times we change our mind. When I draw on the whiteboard, I repent too many times. What do you mean? I, I pick which color I want. I go, no, not this one. And I choose this one. But I didn't give a statement like, I promise I'm going to use a blue pen. I'm not going to let all of you down. All right? I'm not going to let you onliners down. I promise I'll use a blue pen and never offend you next time. I never put a word like that. But uh, you notice how ridiculous this is. I'm trying to make you understand through this nonsensical example that isn't it common sense and isn't it ridiculous that you would criticize me if I choose whatever pen that I want to do? But if I put my word to it, that's different. See, I don't understand why people make a big deal about God repenting. Changing his mind. He could do whatever he wants. He's a person. He has a free will, free ability, whatever. Amen. He can do whatever he wants. I don't know why you criticize him for doing that. Leave God alone. He can do whatever he wants. Amen. It's when he puts his word to it, that's where he doesn't repent. That's where you can feel like you've been betrayed and say, Hey God, you promised this in your word, but you let me down on this. Look at Romans 11. Romans 11. Romans chapter 11. You'll notice at verse 29, Romans chapter 11, verse 29, God does not repent, but it comes in context of His Word. It comes in context through when He gives what He mentions here, His gift and calling. That's what He worded it as. The context is when He puts... His word to it. Romans eleven twenty nine. 29. For the gifts and calling of God are what? Without repentance. He doesn't change his mind. Notice what's going on. The context. You'll notice that verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is what? Written. See, he put it in his Bible, his word. When he puts his word to what he promised to Israel... Verse 29, he cannot change his mind about it. So there's a heretical doctrine called replacement theology, meaning that the church replaces the nation of Israel, and Israel has no promise of God any longer. No, God says at verse 26, he put his word to it. He promises them national salvation in the future. And verse 29, he can't change his mind about it. All right, let's go back to... Genesis 6, Genesis 6. When you believe in replacement theology, you attack God. In other words, you attack His attribute, His immutability, unchanging. 
That's why we believe in the immutable God, unchanging. In other words, that God's not the type of guy who will always change his mind in whatever he states that you, rel uh, that you lack trust in him. That's the idea. God has the freedom to change his mind on whatever he wants to do in normal, natural situations. Because everybody does that. But where it lacks, uh, where it betrays your trust in him, where he's a liar, where he's a guy who's paranoid and going, oh, should I do this, should I do that? Then obviously that's not a proper God. That's why we say he's immutable. Do you understand now? Okay, that's what we mean by immutability, that we believe in that. Unchanging in the sense of, he's a God I can trust in. He's not going to let me down. I can put my faith in him. Besides, there are some times, don't you put your faith in people sometimes or in leaders when they change their plan or their system for your betterment? Yeah, sometimes it's that way. Sometimes people will say, Pastor, you have not changed. In other words, like, I don't compromise. And then I'm the same preacher that's going to preach hard and teach the way God taught me to teach. But that doesn't mean I never change my mind in all my life, especially when I draw on a whiteboard with, with pen that I want to do. Does that make any sense right there? Okay, so that's the idea. God repents, changes his mind in very normal situations that are very understandable, and he has a right to do so, like I do. But he is immutable in the sense where he is a dignified leader and a God that we believe and trust on, and we know that he won't betray his word. Amen. All right, let's go to Genesis 6. Remember, the context is always his word, his word that he doesn't repent. So that's why that book, when you change that book, I have to add this. So if you believe in 200 different Bible versions where you change God's word into all different words, yeah. then, uh, I mean, don't, aren't you getting rid of the immutability of God where he says he doesn't change his mind on his word? His word. Yeah, that's, good. that's why we take a perfect Bible seriously. Mm -hmm. it's, not a matter of we, it's not a matter of King James versus ESV versus NIV. Yeah. It's not about King James. Mm -hmm. If we put a different name of the Bible and we called it like, I don't know, uh, uh, the real Bible or whatever, it doesn't matter. Name is not the issue. The issue is, do you have a one perfect Bible which word does not change? Amen, brother. That's the issue here. It just happens to be the name King James, okay? So that's the issue. So since we take that seriously, we're like, well, obviously it's not 200 different Bibles then because they all change different words and God should not change His word. So we have to find one that's an unchanging word. And then the best candidate when you compare all the verses is the King James Bible. If you have questions on that, always feel free to ask me or some of the people who are more knowledgeable about this, okay? Because... Uh, I mean, there are verses that are literally taken out and doctrines corrupted by modern Bible versions. Okay, but I've talked too much on verse 6. Let's go back to verse 7 now. Genesis 6, 7. And the Lord said, okay, so God Jehovah is speaking here. What did he say? So he's about to change. Remember, context is he changed his mind about his creation. So what did he do? I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. So he says, I will, future tense, I'm going to wipe out mankind, all of hum the human race that I've created, and I'm going to wipe them off from the face of the earth. That's the idea, that me metaphorical expression, you know what that means, right? I'm going to wipe you off from the face of the earth. So from the surface of the earth where you don't see them anymore. Both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the earth. So God's saying both. So meaning that it's not just man alone. Both man, both means including. So including man with what? Animals and beast. See that? And the creeping thing. Animals that can crawl. Anything that uh, crawls. Insects, snakes, etc. And the fowls of the air. So the birds that fly. Now look at this. This is very strong. For it repenteth me. So uh, w it repenteth me. So something that mankind did with the animals then. See that? Hey, word for word. All right. Sometimes you don't even understand basic word for word interpretation. That's why you don't understand something deep. All right. Now I'm going to get to something deep. But to understand something deep, you've got to know basic word for word. 
Amen. All right, look at the basic word for word. For it repenteth me. So context of it, just like what we did with verse 6, right? And it repented the Lord, right? Something's going on. So what follows what God changed his mind about? We saw both man and beast and the creeping thing. So it's inclusive, right? Man did something with the animals that made God change his mind. Whoa. Let's get deeper than that. For it repenteth me, so God changed his mind about this interaction with men and animals that I have made them. Whoa, that's strong. God said not only he re changes his mind about uh, his creation of man, but also animals. So the creation of man, humans, and animals. Now that's pretty strong there. Why would God change his mind on creating the animals? Aren't they innocent? They didn't do anything wrong. Isn't it mankind? Why would God wipe out the animals? Because the context again, it says both man and the creatures, right? So showing here mankind and the creatures did something together. What did they do together? My, my, my. Well, so far what we read here... What was the corruption? When we read verses 1 through 4, it's that intermingling. Wouldn't it be natural that if the fallen beings right here, they intermingled with mankind, mankind's imagination and heart can go so evil continuously, and then when they go through this intermingling, they are curious, and they go, what if I intermingle with other stuff? Now, don't look at me like a tree full of owls and pretend you're all innocent. You know that's what your heart is capable of. When you play with something sinful, especially with something sexual, then the mind plays where, let me get curious and intermingle with something more out there. That's why you get into same-sex marriage right there. That's why you get into bestiality right there. That's why you get into darker and darker plays. So that's what happens... When uh, the sons of God intermingle with mankind, the, the imagination runs wild, they say. Right? The imagination can go so far. Mankind gets curious. Why? Because this is higher knowledge and higher education. No, it's just higher wickedness. That's what it is. God gave you, a, mankind, a gift, and that is imagination, creativeness. But when you taint that... It will go endlessly in its creativity of experimenting with all sorts of stuff that you dabble with. All right. Is this true? Look at Jude. Jude. Look at Jude. So they intermingled with animals then. They intermingled with animals. That's where you get those weird myths about the centaurs, the mermaids, succubus, and all sorts of half-human, half-creature, right? Where did they get all this from? So let's put uh, succubi. I'll just put this one. But all these strange creatures that result from this intermingling... Where do, you got to realize this, where did mankind ever came up with those myths anyway? Let's say these are myths, these are fake stories. How they come up with this kind of idea? A basic 101 mythology that I've learned, I took a mythology class, is that myths just don't come out of thin air like that. There's an original true story somewhere. And then it's through word of mouth they hear that. And then their imagination plays where it becomes more fictionalized and then they dabble with it, right? That's the idea. So the idea is they got it from some sort of experience or account somewhere and then a myth turns into where they just stretch it and exaggerate it more, right? So that's what we have to think about. Where did these myths get their ideas from? There was a real experience or situation or something they heard about before. And that's from the intermingling of the sons of God with mankind, which will explain a lot of these. And even some people claim to have saw these strange creatures. 
So it's, uh, when you're an atheist or a high, higher skeptic, it's easy to dismiss the people and say, well, it's unscientific, it's not real, and it's fake. But, you know, to be very honest, if you were one of these people, and if you heard all the accounts of these people, you would, you would notice right here that these people, they're genuine in their stories sometimes, and it's hard to dismiss them. Sometimes it's hard to dismiss a person's case and accuse them of being mentally ill or being crazy when you deal with somebody. Scientists even admit that with their research, that research cannot replace experience. Sometimes an experience can be so unique that uh, research and science cannot be reliable on that sense. I know that's hard to believe, but that's why I've learned in basic research methods too. Sometimes experience is going to be different from research, from science itself. So, understanding the factor here, then can't we be open-minded to the possibility of this intermingling? But more so with, if Scripture says so. More so with, if Scripture says so. Look at Jude, and uh, let's see here. Look at verse 8. I like verse 8 here. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. You notice that? That matches with Genesis 6. The imagination, the dreaming is evil. But notice it's sexual. It says filthy dreamers. And it says defile the flesh. This is sexual here. But let's look at context. Context, verse 6. So we looked at 8. Now look at 6. We're going to look at context is so strong. Verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate. Wait a minute. We read that. Yeah. Right? The angels, they didn't keep their heavenly abode status, their celestial state, when they intermingled with humans and lost it. Remember that? And we went to the verse and I explained that, right? All right. So this is Genesis 6 then. Now look what happened then. In Genesis 6, the angels, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as, wait a minute. So, Jude 1 6 is talking about Genesis 6, right? Can we agree with that? All right, if we agree with that. Verse 7 says, even as. You know what that means, even as? It's pretty simple, it means in like manner. Following the example of, in similitude with, similarly with. Oh, so then the fallen angels are going to follow a similar pattern as what in verse 7? Keep reading. Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner. Isn't that very plain right there? In like manner. So Sodom and Gomorrah, what they did is very similar with the angels then at verse 6. In what? Keep reading. Giving themselves over to fornication. Oh, that's plain. Genesis 6 told you they intermingled. They were having sex with all kinds of stuff. So the angels were doing that. Sodom and Gomorrah was doing that. And going after what? Strange flesh. Now, do you know what strange flesh means? Some people don't realize this. Strange flesh, what that means... Okay, flesh... Go to Genesis 6. Look at Genesis flesh. Uh, Genesis flesh. Genesis 6. Genesis 6. This is what happens when you write words and you talk. Some people say, I don't know how you do that. You know, that's a miracle. To be honest, no, it's not a miracle. It's, I'm, it's hard. You know, I'm going three things at once in my mind, okay? <laughs> All right. When the Bible says flesh, okay? The, here's an example. The Bible says all flesh is as grass, right? Yeah. And the glory of man as the flower of grass. Yeah. So when the Bible says flesh, forget strange. When the Bible says flesh, we know this is referring to man, right? Yeah. All right. That's flesh. Can we agree? But when you combine these two words together, and then you concentrate on strange... What does the word strange mean? Oh, it's simple. You look it, look it up in a common sense dictionary. Strange means other, unusual, another. Wait a minute. What is an other flesh besides man? 
Aren't they animals? Aren't they animals? Yeah, because the Bible shows you what flesh is. There's another type of flesh, other type of flesh. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 6. Context, context. <laughs> Genesis 6, that's where we're commenting on, so let's look at context of what was going on with the flesh. Look at Genesis chapter 6. And then notice what the Bible says concerning about the flesh. If we look at verse 19, 19. And of every living thing of all flesh, right? But this ain't humans that Noah is bringing into the ark. God tells Noah to bring in what? Two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark. Verse 20, animals. See that there? There's your other flesh, another flesh. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind. The verse may not say plainly, they have sex with animals, but no, the Lord won't do that a lot of times in scriptures. The Lord, what he'll do is that he wants to see if you're studying and you're paying attention to every word. Amen. And then when you at pay attention to every word, rather than glossing through it like a lot of the people do, and yes, that includes the Bible scholars. They always gloss through, make up in a metaphorical interpretation. Yeah. That's laziness. Amen. You have to study every word. When you do that, you're going to find the deep doctrine in there that you would have gone, whoa, I would have totally missed it out. What did we do? We went context and word for word and scripture with other scripture. And by doing that, we realized, wow, I just found out the fallen angels, they were having sex with animals. And that would explain why all these different weird sort of creatures came out. My, my, my. Let's go back to Genesis 6. Genesis chapter 6. And then we'll look at verse 8. All right, we're going to come across a very important doctrine. Now, there's a heretical doctrine that you want to avoid that some people never heard about before, and that is called hyperdispensationalism. Now, you might say, what is hyperdispensationalism? Well, hyperdispensationalism, what that is, is they believe in dividing the Word of God. Now, we believe in dividing the Word of God. That's why we're called dispensationalists. But we're not hyper about it. So we don't go overboard with it. But there are people who get into dispensationalism and they go overboard with it. They go hyper. That's why they are called hyper dispensationalists that you want to avoid. All right, so dispensationalism, this is correct, okay? Let's put a star next to that. But this guy right here, it should be crossed out and it should be avoided. Now, dispensationalists, we believe that you have to rightly divide things to the right group of people, right time, period. So what we believe is this, and there are people who are against dispensationalists, which is why I think I should put another heretical doctrine right here. We're going to cover all this. This all ties to dispensationalism. It's called covenant theology, but it's also called covenant of grace. It doesn't matter. Point is, both of these head toward Calvinism. They're a Calvinist doctrine. Now, not necessarily all of them are Calvinist, but it is, actually. Now, covenant of theology, but I'm going to aim more for covenant of grace, grace, that teaching. But I'm just going to put them both together. I know that I'm not going to give a scholastic, technical, accurate definition, but I'm just making it simplistic, okay? The idea is this, is that they do not believe, bottom line is they do not believe in dispensational salvation. Okay, what does that mean? So let's sum it all together. We believe that you have to divide verses to the right group of people, right time period. Amen. We don't believe all verses in the Bible apply to us. Amen. Because if we believe in that, then that's why you believe in wrong stuff. So for example, there are verses in the Bible that will say you have to do works for salvation and your faith is not enough. But what we Christians insist is that those verses are applied at different time periods and different group of people. It doesn't apply to us. We believe that when the Bible says not by works for salvation, but by faith alone, those verses apply to us. Amen. 
But how do we do that, right? How do we do that? We, don't, we can't just randomly say, oh, it doesn't apply to me, it doesn't apply to me, it doesn't apply to me, it doesn't apply to me. Oh, that verse applies to me. Obviously, you can't do that. So how do we do that? It's pretty simple. Let's start with the basic first, okay? The first basic is Old Testament and New Testament. Now, isn't that simple? Don't we know that they're different? I mean, even your Bible uh, titled it that way. That's common sense. Old Testament is not the same as New Testament. Can you agree that things that we do in the New Testament is different from the Old Testament? Yes, we can agree with that. Okay? You know why that's simple? In the Old Testament, you had to be stoned to death if you said a cuss word, basically. All right, then you and I would have been dead on the spot, right? So in New Testament, it's more grace right here. So, understanding the Old Testament is different from the New Testament, that's why, think about this, in Old Testament, their salvation will obviously be different from New Testament. You might say, why? In the New Testament, Christians are saved by faith alone, not by works. Amen. Do you remember why? It's all because of the work of Jesus Christ. Amen. Because he died on the cross. That's why it's, our works don't count for our salvation. It's only by putting our faith in what he did on the cross. But in the Old Testament, they can't do that. You might say, why? Because Jesus did not die yet on the cross. See that? Jesus did not yet die on the cross. So it's common sense that during that time, that's why they had to do works. So the hyper dispensation. So this is dispensationalist. We differ from covenant theology. Hyper dispensationalist. They believe like we do. Yeah, that's right. We believe in different salvation. But they go as so far as to say that, well, that's the reason why if a person got saved by grace in the Old Testament, that there was uh, no salvation by grace involved. Absolutely none. It's just works. That's what they insist. They go overboard in that sense. No, we don't go that far. We believe that when there were people saved in the Old Testament... That there was grace involved. There are elements and some forms of grace involved here. It's just not as big as us in the New Testament. Our grace is so big that God's like, uh, absolutely no work required. That's what God says. Amen. That's my grace because Jesus died. Praise the Lord. But in the Old Testament, I mean, you got to be honest now. In the Old Testament, if God never shed grace on anybody in the Old Testament... No one would have been saved and no one would have uh, been rescued from destruction of sin and everyone would have died and everyone would have went to hell, right? Why? Very simple. Mankind, if they get justly what they deserved, then guess what? Everyone would have been gone a long time ago. So see, God puts grace in the Old Testament. There's no doubt about that. I mean, if you study your Old Testament, there's so many examples of it, right? The children of Israel, they complained, whined at God, but God always gave them grace, right? Samson, he fornicated, messed up so many times, God gave him grace. In fact, he put him as a saved individual at Hebrews 11. So much for salvation by works for Samson, right? Uh, another example, Moses is a murderer. Now Moses, he should have died for murdering, and the law of Moses... That was their system, but God gave him grace, right? David, he should have been uh, killed for adultery and murder. And by Old Testament law, Old Testament salvation, he should have lost it. He should have went to hell, but God gave him grace. That's why David knew he could lose his salvation. And he said, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Because he knows Old Testament salvation is very different from New Testament. He realized it is a work system. So see this? When you're dispensational, you don't agree with these guys that there were no work salvation. No, David knew that. That's why he said, don't take the Holy Spirit from me. But also, dispensational is balanced that we don't go this extreme because David should have died and lost his salvation, went to hell, but God gave him grace. See that? So that's why dispensational, they're truly in the middle. They're balanced. If, you're, if you wrongly divide, you're going to go either extreme. And you're like, man, I don't want to mess up in that. That's why I stopped messing around with YouTube channels. 
They, uh, there's a bunch of them claiming themselves to be dispensationalists, but they're hyper-dispensationalists. You got to watch out for these heretics, these guys. They, they even uh, go so as far to take away Christian doctrine and say, oh, that applies to a different time period, different group of people. Then you're so extreme. And there are people out there that deny uh, a pre-tribulation rapture. They deny that uh, God will restore the nation of Israel and dispensational salvations. They go right here, too. So the YouTube channel is endless where you can go into that. you got to be around a Bible-believing church. Church means a called-out assembly group of people. When you find the right people who are in unity together and Bible-believing churches, then you're going to stick by the right stuff outside of that church and going to different churches or different rogue people who are not a part of it, I guarantee you, you're going to go a little bit right here and a little bit right here, and these aren't the only two false doctrines. Yeah. There's a bunch out there you're going to get messed up in. That's why I keep encouraging you onliners to go to a, attend a Bible-believing church. No pastor is perfect. No people is perfect. You can find some imperfections, Amen. but that's the best group you've got. Amen. we got a church directory in our website, realbiblebelievers.com. Uh, look in our video. It's, the link is right there. Just click on that website and go to the tab where it says church directory and attend one. And then if you don't have a Bible-believing church nearby you, that's the reason why I had a burden to go online and just stick to our channel and the channels that we would recommend. Uh, I have a video about internet sites that I recommend, right? So you can look at that one. So uh, just stick around a Bible-believing church called out assembly. All right? You got to stick to those group of people. Don't go in other groups. A little bit off here is what? Heresy. It's stepping into heresy. So you got to watch out for that. All right. Understanding that, now let me explain verse 8 and 9, all right? So I explain all this dispensational stuff so I can explain verse 8 and 9. Verse 8 and 9 is a, debunks these two doctrines. Amen. Genesis 6, 8 through 9 is the perfect text to prove a right balance of dispensationalism. You want to mark that down, all right? This is uh, probably the only text I can think of that will be in the right balance of dispensationalism that will address hypers and covenant theology, covenant of grace. Verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So in other words, uh, God, in his eyes, he was able to find grace in Noah. So Noah, he actually, excuse me, I think I should reword it this way. Basically, Noah, what he discovered, what he found, is the Lord gave him grace. The Lord gave him grace. And God saw grace within Noah. So that's amazing. I don't know what God ever saw in Noah because you know what Noah is capable of, right? You read later on, he got drunk. He got drunk. He messed up with alcohol. He sinned. But in God's eyes, he somehow found grace. Uh, he somehow saw grace in Noah and Noah was able to find and discover grace in the Lord because of, because of that. Man, that's wonderful. That ain't hype. Notice that hyper-dispensationalists, they insist, no, it's completely by a work salvation system where there is no grace involved. You'll notice right here that, no, there is grace right here. There is grace right here. Noah found, uh, Noah found something that he did not deserve, yet he got it. So he got grace. But notice at the same time, at the same time, at verse 9, verse 9, this does not mean there was no work salvation that Noah did. Look at verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. So now it's going to explain Noah's generation. Why is Genesis 6-9 wording it that way? Because it's talk, uh, it's, it talked about Genesis 5, the generations, right? Now remember Je Genesis 5, 28-32 is talking about the good guys generation, right? We covered the good guys generation which is starting from verse 21, excuse me, 21 through 32. From Enoch all the way to Methuselah and then to Lamech and then to Noah. So remember that Jared was the last line of apostasy at verse 20. So Jared was definitely not included there. But then 21 and onward, it was Enoch and all the other guys that were in the good guys generation. 
So then being in the good guy's generation, we notice that at chapter 6, God is continuing that story of the good guy's generation. At chapter 6, verse 9. Because he had to put a... He had to put it in between in the story what happened during the generations. That's why Genesis 6, 1 through 8, he had to put an in-between story there, what happened. Now, continuing on with the good guy's generation at verse 9, look at this, Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. Whoa, wait a minute there. Noah is considered just, so he's considered as a good man, honest, and perfect. He's considered perfect within his generation line. Remember why? The generation lines was getting corrupted. Notice it says, in his generations, plural. Why? He had forefathers that were following a perfect just line. Uh, which we saw Enoch and the other people, right? And Noah walked with God. Oh, following Genesis 5, Enoch, right? Where he walked with God. So he's following that generation line, Noah walked with God. So notice here, there's no mention of Noah that he got saved by grace alone and that it was on the benefit and merit of Jesus Christ and the Lamb and faith and trust in God alone. No, there's none of that right there. That's good, brother. How he's considered just and perfect is not by faith alone and no works involved. He was considered just and perfect. Why? Because he walked with God. Now, how many of you have a good Christian walk? Let's be honest. Some of you might say pretty lousy. Then you wouldn't consider it to be saved during the Old Testament. See, that's why Old Testament salvation is different from New Testament salvation. You can be lousy in your walk as much as you can, and you're still saved in Jesus Christ. Our salvation is based on what Jesus did on the cross, not on our walk. But Jesus didn't obviously die yet, which is why at verse 9, Genesis 6, 9, Noah's salvation was based on his walk. Wait a minute. He's a just and perfect. There's no one who's just and perfect. No one who's just and perfect. Why would the Bible word it that way? See, that proves that Old Testament salvation is different. God has to do something differently with Noah. So Noah, you'll notice that based on his walk, God considered it just and perfect. But then in the New Testament, when you have Jesus Christ's righteousness, and then you compare that with man's righteousness, that's why he keeps seeing sin in man's righteousness. Because there's that gap right there with Christ's righteousness. But there's no gap, no standard that time. So God, he judges mankind on the basis of their walk. And that's why he's gracious enough. He's gracious enough. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He's gracious enough to consider them saved and let them in. Now some critics, they'll try to say, well, grace is not works and the Bible says so. They're very different and etc. But those same people don't realize they're quoting a New Testament verse. And they're quoting a verse that's applied to Christians today at that time period. I mean, uh, you want me to tell you something? You know, in your Old Testament, there's no doubt faith and grace is different in the Old Testament compared to New Testament. You might say, no, I don't think so. Yeah, so, yeah, so, okay. You know why? Because it's simple. You know how many times faith is mentioned in the Old Testament? How many times faith is mentioned in the New Testament? Overboard, man. Like any verse you read, you'll probably see faith. You know, that's how big it is. See, that proves that faith and grace is different in the New Testament compared to Old Testament. People make the wrong assumption to put the same uh, grace at the Old Testament with the grace in the New Testament. You don't want to do that. You've got to be careful of that. That's wrong doctrine. But we don't go as far as to say at Genesis 6, 8 as a hyper-dispensationalist that, com that it's completely dependent on a work system and there's no grace involved. No, there is definitely a grace involved right there. Including when the Old Testament saints failed in their works, that they were considered saved. And that's considered grace. So, uh, what you have to understand with grace, when a person gives grace to you, what are they making? An exception of you, aren't they? When a person 
gives out a rule. All right, this is going to be very eye-opening. You ready for this? This will solve the balance and gets, ri gets rid of these two heretical doctrines, all right? So pay attention, all right? When I make a rule in the church, all right, a rule's a rule, and then you're going to be penalized for it. But because I'm the boss and I'm the leader of an organization, what if I, uh, uh, and there's a person that I'm pretty close with, and then I make an exception to the person. Why? Because it's an understandable situation that person is going through. So I'm going to say, I'm going to make an exception. That means I'm giving grace to that person, right? When I give grace to somebody, what does that mean? When there's a rule that I set out, but I give a grace to somebody, I'm making a what? An exception. When you deny the doctrine of exception, pay attention now, this is going to be eye-opening. When you deny the doctrine of exception, you're denying the doctrine of grace as well. When I give grace to somebody, th what does that mean? I make, that means you're an exception to me. See that? Some of these people who uh, hate dispensational salvations, and when they hear us talking about exceptions, they say, oh, they're just making stuff up. Then uh, how can they believe that there is no dispensational salvation, it's only salvation by grace, no works involved, absolutely not, then if they themselves believe in that kind of grace salvation, how can they deny exception? You have to believe in exception. That's why it makes sense. There's a rule, let me apply it this way. There's a rule in the Old Testament. What's the rule? You got to do works. There's no faith alone system. So you have to have faith, obviously, but there's got to be works in there. That's the rule. But guess what? Samson failed in that aspect. David failed in that aspect. And then God's like, you know what? Uh, I'm going to make an exception to you. Praise the Lord. And he sure did that with Noah, too, when he got drunk, obviously. Uh, so Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You could use verse 8 as well. Because it, obviously, Noah, it's not just drunkenness. I'm sure there were other stuff that he did. So God can put exceptions when he wants to. By the way, there's a, this is basic logic. The basic logic, uh, I don't know if you've heard of this statement. It's used for rational arguments and logic. Exceptions only prove the rules. What does that mean? What that means is when there's a rule, there has to be an exception. And when there's an exception, that doesn't disprove the rule. Exceptions prove the rule even more. It's like, for example... Parking reserved only for pastor. What does that mean? What that, uh, what that means uh, right here is that the parking, it makes the rule over here that it's reserved only for the pastor, right? But let's say we put an exception here, okay? So let's change it where it can say where uh, parking is prohibited except the pastor, all right, the rule is what? The rule is, is that parking's prohibited. But when they put the exception there, except the pastor, uh, that means, oh, I'm an exception. I can park over there, right? Because I'm the pastor. Does that exception deny or disprove the rule? No. When they put an exception there, that only proves the rule. Why? When they put except so-and-so, that makes you think, wait, what does the statement before except so-and-so is saying, it's so important that I'll have to hear, uh, hear it. What is it? There's a rule somewhere. That's good, brother. See that? Good. So, uh, I hope this helped you immensely to debunk hyper-dispensationalism and covenant of grace. Okay, I have to end it here.